Michelle. Happy almost Labor Day. I'm excited for us to have this conversation. It certainly has been a busy summer for the Center for Labor and a Just Economy and for the labor movement. So you spent some time out of the country this summer, uh, taking some time off after finishing up your amazing tenure as the co-founder and co-executive director of coworker.org. So I'm curious, as you've gotten back to paying deep attention to what's going on with workers in our country, what surprises you about where we find ourselves this Labor Day? Thanks, Sharon. Um, yeah, even as I was taking my time off, it was basically impossible to get away from the labor movement. And I mean that in the best way. The Teamsters negotiated this incredible contract with UPS uh, specifically for part-time workers. We've got the WGA and SAG members on the picket line every day, making plain the impact of AI on all workers with a ton of solidarity from the general public. And the UAW strike authorization is the latest sign that where workers have organized, they really do have a chance to shape the economy. And when I was on my break, I met so many people whose eyes lit up when I said I worked in the labor movement. Everyone had something to say. It's not just workers and unions who are motivated. There is this renewed sense of enthusiasm for the labor movement that I haven't seen in my 20 years of doing this work. Labor, it's where the cool kids are. <laughs> anyway, that is a lot of big activity. And there have also been, been some big wins for workers in the states. You know, this summer in Minnesota, the governor signed a bill that creates a nursing home workforce standards board that'll give healthcare workers a voice in how the nursing home industry meets the challenges that have really plagued that industry, like low pay and understa understaffing. And Michigan, really big news, Michigan repealed its right to work law. Amazing. That's so exciting. Um, but, you know, as we've often discussed, we know that there are so many more workers who want to join unions but can't because it is just too hard. And you can just look at what's happened at Starbucks and Amazon. You know, they those workers organized really hard fought campaigns and built a real constituency of people who want unions in those companies, but they've been trying to get those companies to the bargaining table all summer and the companies refuse to join them. We should really talk about what CLJE is planning for the fall to help move the needle on worker power. Yeah, well, we are definitely not taking the fall off here at CLJE. What I'm most excited about is the launch of our CLJE lab. The lab's going to be the home for projects where our ideas hit the ground. So for example, we spent the summer compiling like the best ideas for policies that boost worker organizing that state and local legislatures can implement. So, you know, the folks who work in the state house or city councils. And this fall, the lab is gonna bring together a big group of people to get these ideas and, and create new ideas, but to get these ideas into the hands of workers, organizers, and policymakers so they can then go home and start making change with the benefit of having learned from each other in the movement and with the promise of our legal and policy support as they move forward. I'm also really excited about the work that we're doing to sharpen the connection between workplace democracy and our political democracy, because to speak frankly, both forms of democracy are understressed and need all the help they can get. But Michelle, what do you think are the most urgent issues that we should tackle in the lab? So when we first discussed all of the work that you just laid out, it made me feel such a sense of possibility that really matches the sense of possibility I feel when I see what's happening out on the ground. Um, and we are also in a moment to really take a look at the past few years of worker-led organizing that has taken place and ask ourselves some really hard questions about what are the roles of incumbent institutions in bolstering that kind of experimentation and enthusiasm. What can we learn from what we see workers do for themselves? And what's the difference between support and suffocation in these moments of a lot of activity? I think there's also so much more work to do on AI and the use of technology in our workplaces. The rise of generative AI brings up really complex questions about our work and who owns it and who owns the future. And this has been like a decades long obsession of mine, as you know, and there's a lot more experimentation to do to harness the growth of that industry in a deep way. 
And relatedly, so much of this technology has dictated the ways in which workers have been able to freely associate and express themselves over the past decade. It's a core component of the growth and labor's popularity. So there is even more important to do work to do with our partners in the realms of technology policy and media policy to continue to ensure that that is protected. And that seems like a lot. So we better get to work. I think that is a lot. And Michelle, you know, I thought about while you were going over the, especially talking about the AI issues. I think the first time I really thought about this brave new world of technology in the workplace was reading that report you did for Roosevelt a number a number of years ago before anybody else was really talking about these issues um, in a way that I think has become extremely urgent right now. So I am really looking forward to working with you here at CLJE and with all of our colleagues and stakeholders and funders to continue the fight to build worker power. So everybody, happy Labor Day.